Are you here? Good, because I have the light in my face. All right, so let's get started. So I'm going to talk to you about, uh, about Xamarin, but uh, unlike James in the keynote, which he did very well, he shows you a quick intro to Xamarin. Uh, we are going to go quite a little deeper into architecture, and we are going to talk about this uh, so-called MVVM architecture, model view view model, um, and uh, using the open source toolkit that I developed called MVVM Lite, but basically what I'm going to show you applies to pretty much any framework you want to use. Uh, there, is, uh, there are some very well-known frameworks like MVVM Cross, uh, Prism, um, and others, and so we are going to, uh, to take uh, a little bit of a deep dive into this kind of architecture. So a few words about myself, first of all, thank you, sponsors. A few words about myself, my name is Laurent Bunion, I live in Switzerland, I work for Microsoft since last year. Uh, I'm part of a new team called the Cloud Developer Advocates. And I'm not sure if uh, it's a little bit squished here. I don't know. Anyway, uh, no big deal. So uh, the Cloud Europe Advocates team is uh, quite a large team. As you can see, we are about 60 people nowadays. And we literally travel around the world to talk about Azure, to uh, show you, you know, some demos, to create some samples, create some quick start, write some documentation, etc. And um, inside this team, we all have some expertise, if you want. And my own personal expertise is .NET, Windows, and of course, cross-platform development with Xamarin, which is uh, the goal today. So in case you're interested to follow us, this is where you can find us on Twitter. And we are very active on Twitter, very active in social media in general. So if you want to follow us, there are good chances that at some point or another, a CDA will be in your beautiful city of Madrid. And so you can check us out and come and see us. And we're always happy to do meetups and talk to communities, etc. Okay, so what is really the key of the problem when we talk about uh, universal applications? And of course, Microsoft has marketed universal Windows uh, platform, UWP, okay? And this is pretty universal if you stay in the Windows world, right? But of course, uh, when you consider that, you know, there is a world outside of Windows and suddenly those applications are not really so universal anymore. So fortunately, we have Xamarin, which is helping us to bridge the gap and to really bring the world of .NET to those iOS and Android applications. And it's not just for mobile, right? Because Xamarin is very versatile and it embraces really the native approach. And so basically every time that you have an SDK for a platform, like for example, for Android, we have uh, the Amazon Fire TV is running Android, right? Uh, or if you take um, on the Apple side, you have the Apple Watch, for example, or Apple TV for that matter. Uh, all those are also available through Xamarin. And so you can develop for Apple Watch using Xamarin, for example, and using the principles that I'm going to show you. So let's do a quick reminder first, and I'd like to go a little bit into architecture and talk about MVC, Model View Controller, and then we'll move to MVVM, Model View View Model. So the MVC pattern is a very, very old pattern, okay? It originated in 1984, and usually at this point I ask the audience, how many of you were not even born in 1984? Raise your hand. Don't be shy. Yeah, I see a few hands, right? So. This is a pattern which is literally older than some of you, right? So um, for dinosaurs like myself, we still remember, right? Uh, that MVC basically is based on the model. The model is where, you know, your data is coming from, right? It can be a web service these days, very often, like a REST service, for example. It can be a database. It can be even the device itself, because on the device you have a lot of sensors, and those sensors are delivering data, right? And this data allows you after that to update the UI, like for example, the Compass application that uh, James created before. So we have, uh, of course, the model, and then we have the view, which is what the user is actuating, what the user is using, and this view is going to raise some events, and those events are typically handled in MVC by, uh, you know, a component called the controller. So the controller is super important, right? It does a lot of things. It's going to react to events from the view, like I mentioned, it's also going to update the view, so based on whatever happened, like the user is clicking on a button and then maybe a part of the UI gets disabled, for example, or a part of the UI gets updated. 
Um, that is also the role of the controller. And then it's also going to interact with the model, for example, reading and updating the model with data, and also reacting to events of the model, like in the case of, uh, of the compass, every time that James was moving his device, of course, some events are happening. Now, MVC is the most popular pattern these days in client development. I think we can say that, especially for rich clients like mobile applications, Windows, etc. So on Windows, we have the view is typically made in XAML, okay, be it in WPF, in Windows 10, etc. XAML is an XML-based language, markup language. In iOS, we talk about storyboards. It's also an XML document. And in Android, we have, in Xamarin, we call them AXML. In, uh, you know, uh, vanilla <coughs> Android, they use XML. So basically, also markup. And the reason why they use markup for the view is that markup is good with visual designers. Okay, it's a tool language, but it's also readable by humans. So you can also go and edit it manually if you need. And the controller, in Windows, we talk about the code behind. It's XAML.CS, okay? And in iOS, they, main, they name those controller directly. And in Android, we have activities or fragments sometimes. And so those are typically what we use. Now, when we go to MVVM, we don't remove the controller completely from the picture. It's still there. But the goal is going to remove most of the code or a lot of the code from the controller. Not all the code, because some code makes sense in the controller, like if you have animations, these kind of things. But some of the code is going to get out of the controller, and we are going to move that code into the view model. And so the main difference between MVC and MVVM is really at the level of the interactions between the view and the view model. And this is using what we call data binding. And we'll talk more about data binding later. But I guess we can say that if you don't have data binding in a framework that you're using, then MVVM doesn't quite make sense, okay? So you have to bring data binding in the picture one way or another. And then we also have something called commands, which is also something relying on data binding. So you can ask yourself, okay, we have MVC. We see that MVC is working pretty much everywhere, iOS, Android, Windows. So why MVVM, right? So on Windows, the question has been answered already a long time ago. It makes sense because it's a nice decoupling of the view layer and the, um, and the view model layer. You can have multiple teams, like one team working on the view model, one team working on the view. It works great with designers like Blend, et cetera, et cetera. But in Xamarin, does it make sense? And this is a question I asked myself as well before I ported MVVM Lite to Xamarin. I thought, OK, does it even make sense? Am I just going to lose one year of my life, or I don't know how many months, you know, some time, for nothing, basically? Well, I think it actually does make sense. And so, really, that's kind of the, the key of the matter, right? You have some kind of markup. Like we said, we have some C-sharp, okay, the controller. And really, this is at the controller level that, you know, MVVM starts to make sense, because the controller is mostly untestable by unit test. And the reason why it's uh, mostly untestable, it's because it's going to interact with elements of the view, like controls. And in a unit test, you can't really instantiate a control. Sometimes you can, but really it's kind of messy, okay? Very often, like in iOS, typically you need a context for the controller, and this context is a view itself, and really it gets really difficult. So you want to kind of abstract that. You want to really move this code away from the controller. And also, it's mostly unshareable. What I mean with that is that if you have a, you know, uh, some UI code which is interacting with an Android button and you move that code directly into iOS, it's going to fail because an Android button is not equal to a UI button in, uh, in Apple in iOS. So basically, what we want to do is get away from this uh, controller and move some of the code as much as we can into the view model in an abstract manner. Okay. So basically, if we take a classic Xamarin application, this is how it looks like. You're going to have the model. The model is going to be shared. It can be a large portion of code. It can be 50% easily. Okay. But then on top of that, you still have those three silos, one for Android, one for Windows, one for iOS. It's still C sharp, so that's cool, but it's three different code. And what we want to try to do is basically to do something like that where we reduce the silos, and then we have an additional layer called the view model, which is shared, and then data binding in between for the interaction. 
So at this point, I'd like to show you a demo. I'm going to take an Android application and I'm going to refactor it to MVVM so that we understand a little bit what is at play. Now, obviously, it's a small demo, and so obviously what you're going to see doesn't quite make sense uh, initially um, because it's a very small app, and so I could just write it three times. But I think you will see that as you build on top of this app and you try to make things um, you know, more elaborate, then it makes more sense. I'm going to try to just change the resolution here quickly. I'm sure the tech guy is going to hate me for that, but it is really squished, right? So what happens if I do this? Nah, black bars. Okay, I'm going to go back to whatever I had. Okay. All right, so for the demo, I'm going to go to Visual Studio. And in Visual Studio, I created um, a Xamarin application. And this application, why don't I just run it to show you what's happening? So I'm going to run it here on this, um, on this emulator. And so there is a button, there is this text, nothing yet. And what it's going to do, it's going to connect to a YouTube page. And this is a page that I have online where I publish some uh, drone videos. So this is a, a place close to my, to my house, about an hour away. Um, and so I do those drone videos. And as you can see, there is a number of views here, 793 views which uh, is pretty cool, and of course I love, every morning when I get up, I need to check the number of views. This is like my life, you know, and I really want that in bed, on my iOS device, my Android device, my Windows device, just to make sure that uh, I have, and, and you know, it changes all the time, right? Like in one week I can have two additional views, which is really, oh my God. So in order to do that, what we'll do, is here we have some code, and this code is going to react on click of a button. Okay, is it big enough for the people in the back, the code, yeah? Okay, otherwise you just tell me, huh? Then I'm going to create an HTTP client, and then I'm going to connect directly to this YouTube page, which is a very bad idea, don't do that. Huh? There are APIs for that, but here for this demo, I'm really going to download the HTML directly. And then we go and pass the HTML, which is really horrible code. This code at some point will break, most probably. One thing sure is that I don't want to write this code three times. I want to write it one time in C Sharp, unit test it, be done with it, okay? I don't want to write it in Java, in Objective-C, and also in, uh, in C Sharp for Windows. And then after that, I'm going to show the number of views here. So how can we make this application better? First of all, it's running only on Android. I'd like to have that on iOS and Windows as well. And second of all, it's not very clean. It's not unit tested. It's, you know, it's, uh, there is a lot of code in this controller, which is not great. So first of all, I'm going to create a new project. And for this project, I'm going to take .NET Standard, because you heard Scott Hunter this morning, right? .NET Standard is really the way to go for uh, cross-platform compatibility. The, those uh, assemblies can run on uh, iOS, Windows, Xamarin, but also on Linux, on Mac OS, et cetera. So this is really cool. And I'm going to create here a new one called data. Here we go. <clears throat> and inside here, I'm going to start by removing this class. And now I'm going to add a new folder and I'm going to call that the model. And inside this folder, I want to, to work really cleanly, so I'm going to add a new item, I'm going to add an interface, and this interface is going to help me to unit test later. So everything that I have where I connect to YouTube, download the HTML, now I'm going to pack this into a service. So let's call that iYouTube service. Okay, so now I have my iYouTube service, I'm going to make that public. And then I'm going to add a method, that this method is going to be refresh. And of course, it is going to be asynchronous, so I'm using a task of string for the result. Okay, so now I want to implement this YouTube service. So I'm going to add a new class. I'm going to call this YouTube service. And of course, this is going to be public, and it is going to implement I YouTube service. Voila, I'm going to implement the interface, and so now I have this, uh, this method. And basically what this method is going to do is pretty much what I did before in the activity. So if I go into my activity and I copy everything I had here, just going to copy it and paste it here. And so now I have my HTTP client. 
this is asynchronous, and so I'm going to declare this method async. And then finally, I still need to return the HTML. So now I have the same code as before, but now it is in .NET standard, and which means that I can reuse it in iOS and in Windows, and so I don't need to write this three times, which is cool. OK, now, the next thing we need to do is add some MVVM scaffolding, if you want. So I'm going to add here a new, new folder. I'm going to call that view model. And inside this folder, I'm going to add, first of all, a main view model. Main view model. And then I'm going to add another object, which is called a view model locator, which is just helping me to wire things together if you want. I'm going to show you more details in a second. OK, let's make those two public as well. Public. Now, MVVM has a lot of advantages, but it has one small disadvantage, which is that sometimes there is some plumbing code, if you want. Like, for example, you need to raise a property change event if you want your data bindings to react. And so in order to do that in an easier manner, I'm going to add MVVM Lite to this application. You can choose something else, like MVVM Cross, Prism, etc. In my case, I like MVVM Lite since I wrote it. It does make sense. Before I do that, I'm going to add a unit test project. Like this, I can add MVVM Lite directly to all my three projects. So let's do that quickly. I'm going to add here a new project. And I'm simply going, you can use, of course, any uh, unit test framework you, you like. But in that case, I'm just going to use <coughs> the .NET unit test framework. And voila. And then we are just going to add some references. So I'm going to add a reference on my main application to the data, which is where I'm going to do most of my, of my code. And finally, I'm also going to add here a reference to the same data project into my unit test project. Here we go. OK, so now I'm ready to add MVVM Lite. So I'm going to go here in Manage NuGet Packages for Solution. I'm going to Browse, and I'm going to look for MVVM Lite. But since I'm using .NET Standard, I'm going to take the .NET Standard version of MVVM Lite. So you can find it under MVVM Lite Libs for libraries, STD, STD 1.0 for standard 1.0. So I'm going to take that and add it directly to my application. It's going to download everything it needs. And of course, ask me to accept the license, which I just did. And now it is added. So now I can start using MVVM Lite in my project. So if I go back to my view model, I can add here, I can derive from view model base, which is, a view model, which is an MVVM Lite class, which is going to give me a lot of simplifications of my code. OK, so now I have my main view model here, and I want to add a property which is going to get the result. OK? And so again, I'm going to do this in an abstracted manner. So before in my activity, I was going to write the result of my parsing, of my HTML parsing directly into the label, OK? Which is a bad idea, because like I said, I cannot unit test that. So here, I'm going to put a string property, which is a good abstraction for these kind of things. So when you install MVVM Lite in Visual Studio, here I just installed the NuGet. But there is also an extension that you can install. So if you go to extensions and update, and if I go a little bit further down, uh, I forget where it is now. All somewhere there is um, funny. I don't see it. Anyway, somewhere there is the MVVM Lite extension, and the MVVM Lite extension is going to give you a number of things, like for example, some snippets. So here, if I just type MVVM, you see I have a number of snippets. And those snippets are going to be extended, when I click on tab, to a full-blown property. And in that case, with I, uh, MVVM INPC set, for example, it's an INPC, so it's an iNotify property change. It's a property which raises the property change event using the set syntax. So let's do that. I'm going to extend. And as you can see, now I have a new property. And this set method here is going to raise the property change event. So basically, I can use a data binding on that. So let's make it a string. Call this result. <clears throat> I'm going to initialize with nothing yet. And now I have my property ready. So you see, I jumped from field to field using the tab key, 
which is, of course, a lot uh, more, a lot friendlier than having to type everything by hand. And now I need to add a command. So the command is also an abstracted way to execute code. And I'm going to bind this command to my UI button. But the good thing is that the command, I write it once, and then this code is going to be executed from Windows, from iOS, from Android, without having to write the code three times. So in order to add a command, I do MVVM, and this time R for relay, relay command. And I'm going to call that refresh command. Voila. And then after that, I'm going to just add a reference to uh, galasoftmvvmlight.command, which is where this relay command object lives. OK, <clears throat> so the refresh command, what it's going to do, it's going to connect. First of all, it's going to say, please wait. OK, then it's going to await a service.refresh. OK, we don't have that yet, but remember, service.refresh, it really sounds like the YouTube service. I have refresh here, so that's pretty cool. We'll do the, the rest of the wiring later. And then if something goes right, if everything goes right, I assign the result to this result property. Otherwise, I'm going to write the result of the exception, the message of the exception, to the result property so that I can warn the user. That's kind of my definition of my, of my view model, if you want. And this code is shared again. OK, so now let's worry about that. So I need to await this method. So let's make this asynchronous, OK? And then finally, I need this service. How do I get this service? Well, like I said, it looks like an iYouTube service, OK? So I'm going to say, in my view model, I want to get, every time that this view model is, in, is uh, in, um, instantiated, sorry, I want to get an iYouTube service. OK? And notice that here I'm using the abstraction. I'm using the interface. Because in my view model, I don't want to care about the implementation of the YouTube service. I just want to know that there is a refresh method. That's all that matters. OK? And then I'm going to save that so that I can reuse it later. So I save that as an attribute, which I'm going to generate now. OK. Good. So now, that's. Good, my view model is ready. So now, how do I prepare everything? How do I make sure that my view model is going to get an iYouTube service whenever it is created? And that is the task of the view model locator. So I like to do this here. So first of all, we are going to add here a constructor. It's static, so it's going to be executed every time that, you know, the first time that the view model locator class is called. And I'm going to use here a component called simple IOC. It's an IOC container, which is also contained in 2MVVM Lite. Now, if you prefer, you can use any IOC container, or you can even do the depend dependency injection yourself. Okay? Here, in that case, I like to use the IOC container because it makes things really easier. And so what I'm going to say here, I'm going to say every time that anybody in my application requires an iYouTube service, I want to use the production version of my YouTube service. At the moment, I only have one version, so that's cool. But later, I'll have another one, OK? And then I'm going to register the view model as well. And then I'm going to add a property here. And so what it says here is that whenever this property is called, I want to check into my simple IOC, into my IOC container, do I have an instance of main view model? If I don't have one, I'm going to create one. That simple IOC's task. You don't have to worry about that. It does it. But since the main view model requires an iYouTube service, the next step is going to check again in simple IOC, do I have an instance of iYouTube service, yes or no? If I don't have one, I'm going to create one. And remember that I said, every time I need an iYouTube service, please give me a YouTube service, my production YouTube service. And then I'm going to pass that to the main view model in the constructor, generate the constructor, and then cache it. Does that make sense? I don't see you. Say yes. Good. Say no if, you didn't, if it doesn't make sense. Ooh, people are scared. Good. All right. So now we have basically the scaffolding ready. So now before I move on to modifying my application, I'd like to unit test that because there are a few things that I specified here. The first thing I specified in my main view model is that if everything goes well, 
I want the result of the refresh method to be assigned to this result property. And then the second spec is, if things go bad, I want the, the message of the exception to be assigned to this result property. That's my spec. So let's unit test that. So as you remember, we have a unit test project here. And so how can I unit test these things? So the first test method I'm going to add, I'm going to say, okay, let's add here a constant, so basically something that I know that I can assert, and then, uh, oops, sorry, wrong place. The first uh, test method that I'm going to add here is that I'm going to create a YouTube service, but you see here I'm going to, to use a test YouTube service. So why do I use a test YouTube service? It's because I cannot really call Google and tell them, hey, I'm going to unit test from 10 to 10.15 today. Can you please shut down YouTube so that I get an exception and I can unit test that the message gets copied properly, right? Believe me, I tried, they don't like it. They tell you, who are you? Don't call again, okay? So I'm going to simulate that. And it's easy to simulate now because I have my infrastructure. First of all, I have an iYouTube service. And second of all, I have some dependency injection going on. So I'm going to be able to create this test YouTube service and I'm going to do that directly in my test project. So let's go and add a new class. Test YouTube service, okay? Now this test YouTube service is also going to be public and it's also going to implement I YouTube service, all right? But this time what it's going to do, first of all, it's going to declare here a constant which is going to be a well-known value that I can assert. And then I'm going to have this refresh method. And here's the refresh method, I'm going to do things synchronously. I'm using here task completion source. It's a utility class in .NET which allows you basically to do some asynchronous work in a synchronous manner if you want. So basically I'm, I'm returning the task here because I, I actually want a task as a result. And here I'm going to set the result which is going to trigger the await to actually do the work, okay? Cool, so now I have that. But I have a second spec. The second spec is if there is an error, I want the error to show in my UI as well, okay? So how can I test that? Well, what we can do here is add another constant, which will be the exception message, and again, I can assert that. And then I'm going to add a constructor, and this constructor is going to help me know if I need to force an error or not, okay? And then finally, I'm going to modify here the refresh method so that if I want to force the error, I'm always going to raise an exception, to throw an exception, otherwise I'm going to set the result properly. So now I have my test service ready, which means that in my unit test, I can create my main view model. And you see here, I'm not even using uh, simple IOC, I'm not even using any IOC container, I'm just injecting the test service manually in the constructor, and then I'm going to call the refresh command, and I'm going to assert that the result property is indeed equal to my result passed. Finally, I have the other test method, and so in this time, I'm going to create the test service, but notice that this time I say true. I say, hey, every time I'm calling refresh command, every time I'm calling refresh, I want you to throw an exception. Then I'm going to create the main view model like before, and I'm going to assert that the result property is the exception message. Okay, at this point, if we build quickly, we should be able to see in the test explorer the test appearing, okay? My two tests are here. And if I quickly run them, here we go. It's going to take just a second and then we should see that they turn green. So basically I have modified my application in a manner, it's not running the test, uh, go on. Modify my application in a manner which is a lot more uh, friendly than before and now it's green. So if I make changes and I break something, then I know that I have some security. Okay, last thing I need to do in my application is modify, that's not what I wanted to do, modify my application to actually take advantage of MVVM. So what we will do here, in the Android application, I'm going to go into my activity. I'm going to pretty much remove everything 
here because this whole code is obsolete. Now I don't need it anymore. And I'm going to add some data binding. So in order to get the data binding, in Windows, we declare the view model locator in app.xaml.cs. That's pretty convenient. In iOS, there is also an, uh, uh, an application class. Here, I don't really have that, but I can add one. So I'm just going to add an app class. And I'm going to declare this class public static. OK. And then after that, I'm going to say, OK, this is where I have my view model locator. And so as you saw before, when I create the view model locator the first time, it's going to register the uh, IOC container, register the classes, so everything will be ready. And then here, in my main activity, I'm going to add a list because I want to save my data binding. Why do I need to save the data binding? It's because data bindings are weak referenced, okay? They are very convenient because they don't create memory leaks. But if you don't save them, the garbage collector is going to be very happy to actually dispose them. And then your application is going to work like three times, and then it doesn't work anymore. OK? So you need to save those. And then I'm going to add a binding here using this syntax. We'll come back to that in a moment. Between the result property, which is on the main view model in the locator. OK? Now we know that this property is raising the property change event, so the binding is going to work. And the target is going to be the text.text .text is going to be my UI element. And then I add the command, which says that every time I click on the button, I want to execute the refresh command, which is inside the main view model in the locator. And so the result is exactly what you saw before. Okay? If I click here, we have the please wait. And after a short while, we have the 793 visual visualizaciones, because my HTTP client is not using any uh, language header, so basically it's returning me the default, which is Spanish, since we're in Madrid. So that's cool. So now, how does it work in the other frameworks? Well, here is a complete project where I have an iOS application and I also have a Windows application. You see that here I created the iOS UI directly in Visual Studio. You can do that or in Xcode as you want. I have a label and I have a button. And then if I go and see inside the code, Inside my main here, which is my application, this is where I have my view model locator. Okay? And then after that, inside my main view controller, this is where I created the data binding, just like before. But this time I, I am applying the, the target of the binding, if you want, is my UI label.txt. And finally, I have the command, but this time the command applies to the UI button. And if I show you, now we are depending on this guy to not do any problem, and we're also depending on the, uh, the conference Wi-Fi, but it seems to work. Okay, it's working in iOS, that's great. Okay, I'm running the simulator on Windows, but it's actually running here, and it is remoted. And finally, I have the Windows version here, and so here we have a different look and feel for Windows. If I click after a short wait, no surprise, it works as well. Okay, cool. So let's go back to the slides. I'm running just a little bit slow, but uh, it's OK. So I'd like to talk about abstraction, because abstraction is a super important concept when you do cross-platform. And abstraction, in fact, we saw that before in, uh, in James' keynote, right? He showed you the Compass plugin in the Xamarin Essentials. That's abstraction. What it means is that somebody, and I can tell you it's James, by the way, somebody wrote the plugin three times, he wrote one for Windows, one for iOS, one for Android. But you as a developer, you don't have to worry about that. That's called abstraction, right? So why is abstraction important when you do cross-platform? It's because even for a simple thing like that, like a, a dialogue, you see the dialogue looks the same everywhere, right? You have a title, you have a message, and then you have one or more buttons, and those buttons are going to dismiss or to confirm the dialogue. So you have that, but Actually, the code couldn't be more different, OK? So we need to abstract that. And so how does it work? Well, just before, we did an abstraction towards our YouTube service. We said, OK, I don't want to worry, is it actually going to hit YouTube, or is it going to simulate? I'm going to abstract that with an interface. We can do the same thing for this kind of, this kind of things, for what I call view services, OK? So instead of going directly to the view, and saying, I don't know, message box the show, which is working on WPF, but doesn't work on any other framework. We're not going to do that. 
We are going to declare an iDialog service, which is an abstraction. We are going to inject that into the view model, typically, into whoever wants to use that. And injecting, we know how to do that. Okay, you can use the IOC container, or you can directly feed that to your view model. And then after that, we are going to implement this dialog service multiple times. Now that is work, but the good thing is that it's work. If you do it yourself, you do it once only, then you're done, just like James did for the Compass plugin. And also, if you use a framework like MVVM Lite, MVVM Cross, Prism, etc., they all have dialog service, so you don't have to worry about the implementation yourself. And then after that, this is what's going to implement, to interact with the view. Now that has another advantage, which is that you can also use that for unit tests, because just now we saw that we unit test the view model, and then I told you I cannot call YouTube and ask them to shut down uh, the service, okay? Well, similarly, if I want to test that there is actually a dialog being shown, okay, not just that I'm writing the exception message in my UI directly, but that I'm actually showing a dialog, this is not something that I can directly test. My unit test cannot show a dialog, and who is going to dismiss that? Who is going to verify that it's actually uh, being shown? So instead, we can use the same technique. We can create a test dialog service, and this is what we will actually um, uh, what we will actually assert. Okay? Using this technique, you can even test, for example, uh, localization. Okay? You can say, okay, I'm going to set my application to Spanish, and I want to assert that my texts are actually showing in Spanish, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so MVVM Lite, quickly, like I said, I'm not selling anything, but it is a fairly popular MVVM framework. It is very lightweight, and the idea is that you can really pick what you like and leave what you don't like. But like I mentioned, there are other frameworks as well, so make sure to check the one that you like most. Uh, if you go to Xamarin Forms, we'll talk about Xamarin Forms in a minute. Um, they also have some MVVM components directly in Xamarin Forms, but of course, if you prefer, you can also use uh, MVVM Lite or MVVM Cross or Prism. Um, so quite a lot of things. There are, this is an open source toolkit, so I'm following the MIT license, which allows you to do pretty much anything you want except calling me at 2 a.m. to complain that my code is not working. Um, and it is also a part of the .NET Open Source Foundation, which is uh, uh, an institution, if you want, uh, independent from Microsoft, but sponsored by Microsoft. And uh, I'm very happy that I was the very first non-Microsoft project into, uh, into the .NET OSS Foundation. It is on GitHub, yes, finally. It was on Codeplex forever, but Codeplex is closing, and so I finally had a good reason to move to GitHub. So uh, it is on GitHub. I take feedback in contributions, but I'm very conservative because it is widely used, and I'm very afraid to uh, break things, so I'm a little bit careful with that. Cool, so let's talk about data binding now. So what is data binding? And I told you that data binding is kind of the key to MVVM, right? If you don't have data binding, MVVM almost doesn't make sense. So data binding, you can define it as a relationship between two properties, okay? which means that if you change one property, the other one is going to change as well. That's cool. It keeps them synchronized. There is a source and a target. But the thing which is really nice is that this, this relationship is a loose relationship. What I mean with that is that if the, the garbage collector comes and says, hey, I want to garbage collect the source of the binding, are you OK with that? The binding is going to say, you do what you want. I don't want to be involved into that. OK? then the source can be collected. Of course, as a side effect, it means your application is going to stop working, the UI is going to stop responding, but the application doesn't crash or anything, okay, that's fine. So by doing that, you avoid memory leaks, but also you need to be a little bit careful what you do, obviously. So the advantages of MVVM and data binding, we saw already quite a few of them. First of all, if you have a, a neatly structured application then you can build on top of that, you can add new components, you can add new objects, features, and it's going to be quite easy. You can also have some clearly defined teams, like for example, you say, okay, I have one team which is responsible for the UI, <clears throat> those are my designer people, okay? And then I have another team which is working on the view model, finally I have a team working on the model, and they can work pretty independently, okay? In my previous job, very often we did applications before the model, before the cloud services were even ready, but the application was already running. We were just using some test data or some design time data to show to um, the bosses, to the client, whoever, how the application would work, okay? 
It's also better for unit testing. We saw that, OK, because you can pass quite a lot of code into the view model, abstract it, and then you can unit test it. And it's also better for sharing, because again, the view model is going to be shared across all the projects, across all the platforms. And finally, as a side effect, you could say, but it's, it's quite an important side effect, it's also better for design because it allows you to, just like before I had a test YouTube service, I can also do, for example, a design YouTube service. And for example, I can use this design YouTube service to look how is my application going to look like if I have a very long error message. OK, I need to wrap this. I need to format this nicely. That's quite important. And again, this is not something that you can test against a real service. Huh? I cannot call my, my uh, database administrator and tell him, hey, I'm doing a contact book. I want to see what's happening if I don't have any contacts. OK, I want to show maybe a message saying nothing to see here or something like that. And uh, can you just go in production and delete the table? OK, they don't like this either. OK, so the principle of the binding, it is based on iNotify property changed, which is an old interface in .NET, which means that you need to raise the property change interface, uh, raise the property change event, sorry. We saw that before. I'm using the set method, which is defined in MVVM Lite. But under the cover, this method is going to just raise the property change event. It is declarative programming. What it means is that in my activity, I went ahead as soon as the activity is created, as soon as the view is created, I'm defining my bindings, and then I'm running my application. The bindings are going to be evaluated on demand. Okay, and so here is an example. So on the left here we have a XAML data binding, like a Windows XAML binding or XAML informs, and on the right we have the syntax for using MVVM Lite for Android and for uh, iOS. So as you can see, you have a keyword binding. Okay, you have the source object of the binding, which is a selected item, in that case, for example, in the list. And then you have the name, which is a the source property. And then you have the target object. In that case, it's the text element. <coughs> and then you have the target property, so very similar syntax. Now, of course, there are some disadvantages of, uh, to data binding. The first disadvantage is that it's going to be slower to use than if you were directly using your events. And the reason why it's a little bit slower is that it's using reflection under the cover to identify the properties that you need to update. In Windows, they created compiled bindings. You might have seen that, x colon bind, instead of the keyword binding. It's exactly so that it's faster, OK? Under the cover, it's a little bit uh, slower to do a data binding. Generally, it's not a problem, but if you have a heavy list with a lot of data bindings and you want to scroll up and down very fast, then maybe at some point you have to test. If the perf is not good enough, you might have to come away from bindings. That's one thing to be aware of. Also, it's a little bit more difficult to understand. If I have an object where I know my view model, my property is actually set, but the data binding doesn't react, that can be an issue. Nowadays, it's a lot easier than it used to be. But before, if you had a typo in the binding expression, Visual Studio was not telling you anything. OK, so you had to really go and investigate until you would find it. Nowadays, a lot easier. You even get some compiler errors uh, when you have these kind of things. So data binding and commanding, in terms of support, on Windows XAML, it is natively supported. So you have data binding anyway, no problem. On XAML Informs, it's also natively supported. So if you do XAML Informs, and we'll see that in a second, it's also supported. And if you use Xamarin iOS and Xamarin Android, they don't know data binding out of the box, because that's not how they do things in Java and in Objective-C. But if you use, for example, MVVM, right, you get that, MVVM Cross, Prism, um, other things like CSLA, they all have their own data binding support. And by the way, data mining, you might have seen that in HTML as well, OK? Angular, before that, knockout.js, those are all using data binding. So basically, they are learning from the XAML ways to improve the, um, the developer and designer experience, which is cool. OK, I'm going to just quickly skip over that because I want to talk to you about, um, about XAML forms. But here, you have an example. Here, this is uh, something you'll get the repo at the end. And this is a so-called Flowers uh, application, which is like a full-blown uh, master detail view where you get uh, here, you see I'm into the Windows experience. I even have some very nice design time experience directly in Visual Studio. So I can go and modify my view. I can see my list and all this because I am using 
Here, I define the design flower service, just like before I had a test YouTube service. Here, I'm using a design flower service. And then inside my view model locator, it's exactly the same structure as we had before. Here, I said uh, that in some cases, if I ask you to use design time data, please use the design flower service every time that you need an iFlower service. So just like I did before for my test YouTube service, you can do the same for design time experience, which is really nice. This Flower application runs, of course, on iOS, Windows, and on um, Android. And so this is kind of how it looks like. You can refresh. It's going to just connect to a service which delivers a list of flowers. There is also some navigation. And you can see here some commands. <clears throat> then you can add a command if you want and say, notice the button here is disabled. But I say, hello, Madrid. Now the button is enabled. I can save. And now I have a new command. And if I run the same application, for example, in iOS, here we go. I um, can refresh. And then same thing. I have the same experience. It's loading. I can navigate to this application and see the command is here. <coughs> so basically, everything was working fine. And I have the same, of course, for Windows. OK, now very quickly. You might wonder why I take only five minutes to talk about, MVV, uh, about Xamarin Forms, about MVVM in Xamarin Forms. Well, simply put, it's because it's really like Windows, pretty much. Or to be exact, it's almost like Windows, OK? So the XAML is just slightly different. For example, they use binding context instead of data context. It's just a name. It's a little bit annoying. They are working on normalizing all that, making it standard. You might have heard the word XAML standard. Um, but basically, other than that, it's almost the same. There is a reference here if you want to check it out. Um, so basically, MVVM is a first-class citizen in Xamarin Forms. So the hoops that I had to jump through using the MVVM like data binding system, for example, in Android Classic and in iOS Classic, you don't need to use those hoops in Xamarin Forms, but it is directly here. So quick demo. I also have some code here. This is Windows, the Xamarin Forms version of the application. You see that it supports <coughs> Android, iOS, and UWP. The big difference, really, is that I have the UI defined here. And for example, in my main page, I have a list view, which is bound to my flowers uh, observable collection. And if you go the, here, I have a binding to this uh, property. This property is raising the property change event, as you would expect. I'll let you check the, the repo for that. But basically, it is working in the exact same manner. And so if I go and run this application in iOS, uh, here we go. Voila. And then I can run the same application here on Android as well. This is the one. You see that here I have a similar look and feel on both because I defined the UI only once. So the refresh button, for example, is at the bottom. Uh, in, in both applications, uh, because I defined the UI once, and it is rendered like that. And I also have the same on Windows, just like you would expect. So one code based, some MVVM into that. I can share the code, and it's really convenient. In that case, I'm using portable class libraries. If I redo the example which I need to do, I will use .NET Standard, because this is really where it's heading. And these days, you can use .NET Standard completely in Xamarin, Xamarin Forms. It's supported everywhere. OK, so in conclusion, MVVM good. Anything else bad? No, it's a little bit more complicated than that. But MVVM has some advantages. OK, when you do cross-platform, it's going to increase the surface of code that you can share and that you can test. OK, it's going to improve the collaboration between your teams because clearly defined responsibility with some nice abstractions. You're abstracting the differences. And also, it increases the designability. Just like I showed you before, you can see uh, the list. You can use design time data. MVVM Lite is a framework which uh, helps you speed up the repetitive work. I would say this is really the main focus. And uh, it, is, um, it has also a large uh, community of users, for example, on Stack Overflow, uh, but also pretty much everywhere. So if you have some questions, you can find answers quite easily. This is my resources. You can find everything you need in those links. But pretty much everything you need is in gslb.ch slash madrid18. OK? This page is already live. You will find the slides. You will find the link to the repos. 
And I believe there might be even a video, or at least I'm going to post a video at some point when, when the video is uh, public. So everything you need is there. At this point, I want to thank you so much for your attention. See you soon, like they say, but basically I'll be around for the whole afternoon. So if you have questions, don't hesitate to come talk to me. Have a nice lunch. Thank you very much.